morning. And again, thanks for coming back for the last session here. Um, so I am going to address uh, some things about the non-clinical programs for oligonucleotides. And uh, as with Paul's presentation, mine really is geared towards those who uh, do not have a lot of experience with oligonucleotides. Um, so first question is, why do we do non-clinical studies? And there are multiple reasons why we do this. Um, some of the purposes, including identification of end organ toxicity, um, evaluating reversibility of changes that are seen, uh, selection of endpoints that can be, uh, that need to be evaluated in the clinic, uh, relationship of these, these findings to exposure, and also, and ultimately really determining uh, a safe starting clinical dose. And um, I'm going to focus primarily on the early development phase, so really uh, the, the, the programs needed to support entry into phase one. Um, there are also various questions to ask about any particular program, and these include uh, what's the dose frequency and duration that is intended in the clinic? Uh, will pediatric patients be included at any point? Is this an oncology indication? Because there are different studies that are actually not done for an oncology indication. And there are many other questions, but all of these together help guide what a non-clinical program is going to look like for an oligo. So this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start with discussion of the regulatory framework and then um, some just general study components that are applicable to most study types. And then I am going to touch on some typical study outlines for the non-clinical program with an oligo. And then last, I'm going to um, talk about how this uh, it, uh, Im impacts the overall uh, development program, and importantly, are there ways to speed things up? Okay, the regulatory background. So oligonucleotides have typically been reviewed as small molecules for the most part. Um, they are small molecule-like. Uh, they are chemically, or chemically synthesized. Uh, but there are some hints of, of biologics. Uh, one of the issues, and I will talk about this in a, in a few minutes, um, is the need for species specificity, and that's more of a biologic-like um, concern. There are uh, quite a few uh, regulatory guidances for small molecules that are applied to oligonucleotides, but they are not specific for oligonucleotides. So what do we, what do we use to guide us from a regulatory perspective? Oops. So first of all, we use the law. Um, uh, there are, sorry, okay. Um, there are regulatory requirements for use of GLPs, as an example, and this is found in the U.S. in the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, EU. There's a directive, and while these are applied to our oligo studies, they're not necessarily specific for oligos. Similarly, there's the expectations, and these are described in guidance documents. Um, I've listed several here. For instance, um, these guide us on how to put together a TK program, what's required for bioanalytical program. And again, they're not very specific for what we're doing with oligos. It's really not until we get to recommendations in things like white papers and regulatory reflection papers where we start to get down to the, the nitty gritty of what we need to do for an oligo. Um, the one I've listed here is um, by the OSWG, the Oligonucleotide Safety Working Group. I'm going to mention them, uh, or at least their white papers, several more times. Uh, this is a group made up of uh, people from various companies. In fact, you'll probably find representatives from almost every oligo company out there participating in, in the OSWG, uh, as well as regulatory participants and consultants. And uh, this group does meet and talk about and contemplate what are best practices for various questions in um, the development, particularly non-clinical. But last and not least is the experience. Um, certainly for companies that have had multiple programs and have a long pipeline, they're able to uh, apply the knowledge of what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, and apply that to newer programs. A little bit harder for companies that are newer in the field, uh, but there are consultants out there that, that do have experience and can help um, provide that information of what works well, what does not work well. So it's really a combination of all of these that we look at as we consider the regulatory framework around a program. 
Okay, so now I'm going to touch on some of the specific um, study components that are necessary for running these uh, non-clinical studies. So um, species selection. Um, it's expected that you're going to have a rodent and a non-rodent species. And for the rodent, the question is mouse or rat? And the answer is yes. Um, both are used. Both are, are appropriate. Um, mice are often used in the pharmacology studies, and so there's already uh, information known about the um, dose, dose ranges and um, effects, and there's a compound that's, that's working. Um, rats also are used. Um, they tend to be more sensitive in, for some specific um, findings, including uh, some renal effects and also uh, immune responses. Ultimately, it's really... Um, target selection and sequence homology that should be considered, and the ability to uh, compare data across pharmacology and toxicology studies that should be used to determine which, which one is going to be better for your particular program. Um, for non-rodents, really the monkey is the animal of choice. And um, typically, if there is an issue with homology, it's going to be with the rodent and not the, the, the monkey. Um, so often they are a, a good option for having the ability to, to look at exaggerated pharmacology. And there's just a wealth of accumulated data in the monkeys because they've been used for roughly the last 20 years in oligonucleotide development programs um, due to, in part, to some of the historic data with antisense uh, showing hemodynamic changes due to complement activation. So uh, typical programs include one of these rodents and then, and then a monkey. For dosing, um, well, it's great to be able to use your GMP material because then you're, you're definitely qualifying your clinical material. You can use non-GMP material for these early studies. And um, you just have to make sure it's well qualified. Dose levels, we need a range of dose levels from something that shows a no, effect, no adverse effect level up to a toxic dose. Um, a clean tox study is not really a good tox study. You need to show some um, effects. The dose frequency needs to be um, at least as frequent as what, what you plan to do in the clinic. And then the duration, again, really is going to be reflective of what you plan to do clinically. So uh, in, your, in your early study, up to two weeks, the re recommendation is to have one month talks. In the United States, uh, if it's up to 14 days, you can actually do one-to-one -one dosing, so a little bit less. Uh, anything between two weeks and six months, then you need a three-month study, and then beyond that, you need your chronic dosing. Um, I'm just going to I haven't really talked about a particular type of oligo here. I do want to touch on LMP programs. Uh, in most programs, there is a, a vehicle control, and you'll see that in some of the study designs I'm going to show later. Um, for those, uh, those programs that have an LMP formulation, often we also include a formulation control because we want to differentiate the toxicity between the oligo and the uh, lipid excipients. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what is the appropriate type of control to put into these studies. One option is to put in uh, an empty particle because clearly uh, any toxicity seen would not be due to the oligo, it would be due to the formulation. The problem with that is that um, the, the physical properties of an empty particle are really not the same as uh, uh, your drug product itself. So another way to deal with this is to actually use a formulation with a payload, so either an inactive or an active but um, irrelevant to oligo. And so this uh, is, is better as far as um, you have similar physical properties as your drug candidate. Uh, but there are concerns with doing that because you could end up um, with having different toxicity and um, the potential for having a different dose response as well. So to support the in vivo studies, uh, you need to have a bioanalytical method in order to measure um, concentrations and calculate both pharmacokinetic and toxicokinetic parameters. And there's really a variety of options uh, available these days, and they range anywhere from a hybridization type ELISA method. Uh, there's chromatographic methods, which do allow you to look at metabolites, and then, um, our, excuse me, RT-PCR. So there is a variety. Whatever you do decide to go with, though, you do need to 
uh, validate. And so I've listed here uh, some of the, the guidance documents dealing with the validation of your bioanalytical method. Um, for the plasma or serum or blood, whatever you choose to use in your, for your TK analysis, typically we validate one species, and then we can do a cross-validation for the second species. That just saves time and money. Um, something that's important to make sure that's included in your validation and sample analysis is incurred sample reanalysis. And this is basically done to uh, verify the reliability of the analytical method in actual samples. And this is done typically from a non-clinical perspective. It's done um, for each species and uh, each method that you are using. So once you have that bioanalytical method, then you can apply it to toxicokinetic analysis. And I, I put in here a quote from ICH um, S3A, the guidance, that the, the pr primary purpose is to describe the systemic exposure um, achieved in animals and its relationship to dose and the time in your tox studies. So um, typically in rodents, uh, just purely because of blood volume, we do uh, uh, satellite groups. Uh, with monkeys, where it's a little easier to manage the blood volume issues, we can do concomitant TK sampling with the, the tox sampling. Um, one of the key differences between toxicokinetics and pharmacokinetics is the number of time points that are analyzed. Um, typically for a tox study, it is you want to minimize how much blood you're taking from these animals. We want to minimize the impact on the actual study itself and any impact on physiology. So we do limit for a TK uh, analysis, and typically I do like five time points or less. Uh, you want enough to be able to look at exposure. That's the whole point of doing this. Um, so the parameters that we calculate based on, on the blood sampling are Cmax, which is maximum concentration, and AUC last, which is area under the curve, to the, whatever that last time point was. So with TK, you're not trying to do a beautiful curve and calculate lots of you know, half-lives. That's, that's typically not going to happen in a TK program. Uh, we also usually take samples from tissue. Again, this is not usually where we do the full uh, evaluation of tissues uh, across the animal. We, we highlight those that have the potential for end organ toxicity uh, and also activity. So often liver, kidney, spleen, those are the main, main tissues that we start with. Okay, so, so that's some of the, the background information for running these studies that, that apply really to any of these studies that I'm gonna talk about next. Um, I'm going to talk about typical studies that are, are used for oligonucleotides. You'll notice that they aren't that different from what is done for a typical small molecule. Um, we would start off with range-finding studies, and this is important because you need to identify what an appropriate uh, dose range is for your repeat dose studies. And there's a lot of flexibility with the range-finding studies. They don't need to be GLP. Um, so you, there's a lot of ways to do that, but the idea is to, to identify what doses are appropriate to put into the range findings, into the repeat dose studies. Um, I'll talk about the repeat dose studies in a little bit more detail, and then safety pharmacology and genotoxicity studies. Okay, so this is an example study outlined for a uh, repeat dose study in rodents. And I'm gonna, I need to do a disclaimer here. Um, these examples are just examples. They may not fit your particular program, but they're certainly a good place to start. So in this um, repeat test study, we're gonna be, we'd be looking at both male and female animals. There are animals um, that will be uh, terminated at, essentially right after the end of the last dose. And then there's also a group of animals that will continue on in a recovery period. And I want to comment briefly on the recovery period. Um, you don't have to have a recovery period so long that you have absolutely complete recovery from any finding. Um, however, you want it long enough that you do see some uh, trend towards recovery. And uh, you know, with the, the increase in duration of activity with some of these newer compounds, this can actually add quite a bit of time to the program. The endpoints, again, look for a rodent very similar to what you would do for a typical small molecule program, and include everything from uh, ClinOps to um, 
blood analysis for, chemo, uh, for uh, hematology, chemistries, TK, histopathology. All right, so for the monkeys, uh, again, the study design is quite similar to what I just showed you for in the rodents. Uh, animal numbers are fewer. We also don't typically have the satellite group for TK, as I mentioned earlier. And again, the endpoints look fairly similar. Um, we do have a, a, a few additions um, over what we did for the rodents and for some of the small molecule studies that you may be familiar with. And that includes addition of complement and cytokine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is the historical uh, precedent of uh, induction of the um, alternate complement pathway. So what we typically do in these programs is we look for the split products indicative of changes in the, the uh, alternative pathway. And that includes BB and C3A. Uh, it's a, a Cmax effect. So we look early on, um, within just a few minutes of, of the anticipated Cmax, and then we look later on to show that that has declined. Uh, similarly, for cytokines, we typically do uh, a cytokine panel. We look early and late because, again, it's a, a concentration-dependent finding. All right, so safety pharmacology. Um, the study design here is a little bit different than, than for the repeat dose studies. Uh, we can actually use fewer animals and use the animals um, repeatedly. So one, the option on the left is just four animals, and each animal is going to receive each, um, the material for each dose grouped. So you would start maybe on day one with a vehicle control, on day two uh, do the low dose, and then you would need some sort of appropriate washout period, depending on your drug, uh, before starting the high dose group. So again, if we have one of these compounds that has a very long duration of activity, this can end up being very a long study because of that washout period. So on the right is the other option, uh, or another option. Uh, if you've got long duration of activity, you can actually increase the number of animals, have all the animals participate in the vehicle control, and then split the animals up into either participating in the low dose or the high dose. And that way you don't have to wait for um, long duration activity. For oligonucleotides, the emphasis in Safety Farm really is on the cardiovascular effects. So uh, monkeys are usually uh, imp implanted with radio telemetry transmitters, which permits the uh, analysis of um, the cardiovascular endpoints without interfering with the animals. They can just sit in their cage and you get your data. Um, assuming that the cardiovascular endpoints are clean, um, the, the recommendation is to um, uh, not necessarily run the in vitro HERG assay. Uh, it depends on, on the company, and some companies prefer to do this upfront or not, but uh, recommendation is if, if you don't see anything in the, in the in vivo study, then there's really no need, at least early on, to do the HERG study. And there's really low level of concern for uh, respiratory and uh, neurological activities, uh, they can either be evaluated here, and I've shown some endpoints for that, or they can be done in other studies. Um, a functional observation battery can be done in rats for the neurological assessment. So the endpoints include um, clinical signs, the, the data from the telemetry readings, uh, arterial blood gases for a respiratory endpoint, uh, very limited TK, uh, typically like three time points max. Uh, we still want to verify what the exposure was in the animals, but because of the telemetry, we, we want to avoid uh, interfering with the animals, and they get stressed out when you go and grab an arm or leg to draw blood. Uh, and then a neurological exam can be done here, or like I said, uh, in, a, in a separate rodent study. All right, so genotoxicity um, it has been evaluated in oligonucleotides. Uh, I've listed the ICH guidance that is, is typically used to guide what studies are run. Uh, to date, results have gen been, been generally negative, and it's not surprising. Um, and the question's been raised, do we need to keep doing this? And I think the, the answer is yes, especially if we've got newer chemistries, uh, either in the oligo itself or in the formulations it makes sense to go ahead and, and continue analyzing uh, gene, the potential for genotox. 
Um, because a lot of these studies are negative, it is important to verify that you've had exposure to the cells um, if you have a negative result. And uh, it's important to use the full formulation. So if you have an LMP formulation or a conjugate, that full drug product should be evaluated and not just the, the oligo itself. So I'm referring here to um, an OSWG white paper, and the recommendation there is uh, actually quite consistent with option one in this guidance, and includes basically two in vitro studies, one to look at um, changes to chrom or chromosome damage, and one to look at uh, gene mutation, and then in an in vivo assay as well. Uh, for the gene mutation, um, there's been question, you know, it, the AIMS is based on uh, bacterial uh, cell assay, and uh, there is concern about the ability of oligos to get into the bacteria. And uh, the recommendation by OSWG is at this point, if, especially if there's um, non-oligo things like a lipid or, or a um, linker for a conjugate, it makes sense to go ahead and still look at an AIMS study because uh, there's just so much data and it may be more predictive. But for more of a vanilla uh, type oligo, uh, mammalian cell assay could be um, considered. All right, I want to touch on one issue that I mentioned earlier, and because it, it, it does tend to impact quite a few programs, and that is the issue of limited sequence homology. And um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the guidance document M2, uh, sorry, M3, R2. Um, it does recommend that toxicology studies be done in two species. But if you look at uh, the S6 guidance, which is really a, it's for biologics, and there's a little, there is a little note in there it's, um, uh, that says that the information in this guidance may be applicable to oligonucleotides. So anyway, in that guidance, it does suggest that if there's only activity in one species that doing tox in one species may be appropriate. So we have kind of two different options here. Um, so if you have a program where uh, you've got sequence homology only in one of your tox species, typically that's going to be in the monkey. Um, there are different ways to handle this. First option is to do, just do your toxicology in one species. Um, I think there's some nervousness, especially if there's not been discussion with the regulators, that this may not be ultimately acceptable. So a, a second option would be to run the actual candidate in both a, a rodent and, into, and monkey. So essentially, you'd be getting exaggerated pharmacology evaluation in one species, but you'd be getting class effect evaluation in two species. And I, I've certainly seen this as an option for, for some groups. Um, another option is to go ahead and make uh, an, an active animal analog and run both the clinical candidate and your analog in both species. So that way you're getting exaggerated pharmacology evaluation in two, albeit with two different compounds, and also your, your class effects. And then if you, have homo if you don't have homology in either of your tox species, again, consider the, the animal analog. However, uh, there, are, there are definitely uh, concerns with using an animal analog. Uh, the sequence different, you know, the sequence is different, so therefore uh, could lead to different off-target effects, uh, immune stimulation, even pharmacokinetics due to different stability. Um, and there's logistics to consider. You have to make that drug to put into your tox program. So it's yet one more thing uh, to go into the manufacturing facility with. Um, it, it also does not need be, to be GMP, but you, again, you still have to characterize it. And then there's um, uh, some consideration about doing PK or TK on uh, the group of animals that, that receive the animal analog. So it can add a pretty significant amount of work to a program to add in that animal analog, plus some questions about what you might find at the end of it. Okay, so what I would like to do is um, focus on how does the non-clinical program fit in with the rest of the development program? And this is just a very generic timeline. Again, this won't match everybody's timeline out there, but um, 
it's, it's something that I've used in the past. It's about an 18-month program from the time you start your, or you identify your candidate. And uh, ADPD activities, that's uh, analytical development, process development, more in Mark's camp, would begin early on. Typically, at the end of that, there's enough material that you could um, go ahead and start your range finding talk studies. Sometimes there's enough to even start the GLP talks program. It just depends on uh, what size of, of uh, batch you need for the GLP talks program. Bioanalytical method development and validation work needs to start very soon uh, because you want to have the stability samples laid down prior to collection of any, stability, uh, any TK samples in your TOX program so that you're always ahead of um, the stability in the TOX program. And then uh, dosing can begin in your repeat dose study if you need to have material from the GMP campaign, just purely from the amount of material. Uh, that can be pulled out and you can start dosing. Uh, then I've got time in there for actual um, recovery and for uh, reporting analysis. Typically the genotox and safety farm studies are shorter and can be done within the time frame of the repeat dose studies, so they, they don't tend to be rate limiting. Um, but it's important, the, the downward line here on the right, um, which is taking information from the, uh, the draft reports, that information needs to be disseminated into various parts of your regulatory filings, including the clinical. So it's very important to, that you get that um, before you plan to file your, uh, either your IND or your CTA. Now, typically the minute I draw this or provide this to the team, the first question is asked, okay, how can you shorten this? So I have some thoughts about that, and I, I thought I would share that with you. Um, I'm calling this streamlining versus shortening. I think streamlining doesn't uh, indicates that uh, you, you may avoid lengthening your program. That's where I'm going with this. So first of all, um, seek pre-submission regulatory advice prior to starting your GLP talks program. Uh, I think this is really helpful because uh, the, the goal is to get agreement with your planned program and also to take the opportunity to ask the regulators about some of the more sticky issues like uh, the need for dealing with species homology uh, or lack of it. Um, I don't think this is necessarily going to shorten your program, but I think it could avoid lengthening it because if you can get agreement with some of these questions early on, you can avoid having to repeat stuff. Uh, second, incorporate lead times in your planning. And Mark kind of alluded to this with the, the CMC. For toxicology studies that include monkeys, um, there are several months lead time that you need to, to add to your program. Um, honestly, right now it's about four to five months for, for getting a monkey study scheduled. It's a much uh, harder situation with CMC. Um, at this point, I think we're looking at nine to 12 months lead time for a GMP campaign if you're going to a uh, one of the big CMOs. So that has to be added ahead of the, the, or the timeline that I just showed you. Um, there are options to reduce the time to data and your, um, your, your draft report. Uh, it's pretty typical for CROs to quote out ten, somewhere on the order of 10 to 13 weeks uh, from the last, uh, last dose to the draft report. Um, some are amenable to shortening that by typically just one or two weeks. It's not usually much more than that for a fee. So for programs that are really needing um, to, to meet a tight deadline, this can be a good option for trying to speed things up. Submit draft reports to, to an IND. Um, I think this is actually fairly common. Um, FDA in particular allows submission of unaudited draft reports. Um, the caveat is this is not written anywhere, but um, uh, experience is that you do have to have a signed pathology report, uh, even if the rest of the, the report is draft. And you need to have draft subreports. So you still need to have draft of your bioanalytical reports, your toxicokinetic reports, things like that. And then if you, if you take this approach, you are going to need to supply the fully audited report within 120 days of the, um, the timestamp on the IND itself. And my last suggestion is to um, initiate longer duration studies sooner with peel-off 
uh, groups. So for instance, if you are needing to uh, pretty quickly support chronic dosing in the clinic, uh, you could start a chronic study, but add in a three-month peel-off, provide that data as an interim report to the FDA, and that allows you to kind of leapfrog uh, uh, duration of dosing in the clinic. Again, this isn't necessarily going to shorten the timeline. It, it, it possibly could. Um, so I am going to end here with um, a comment <laughs> that dates and the timeline are closer than they appear. So hopefully these are some ideas that you can, you can take with your own programs to um, address this time crunch issue. So thank you very much.